have to give a warm uh, round of applause for the Balaz Boyo. Uh, Salo, Balaz, uh, thanks very much for coming down to uh, chat to us tonight. We're going to watch a fair bit of your work in a minute, but um, my favourite first question is always breaking in stories. Can you tell us how you got started in, in fact, yeah, yeah how you got started in, in the business? Okay, hello. Um, well, I was, I was, I knew very early on what I wanted to do. And how early? Uh, how early on? I am um, somewhere in the age of 10, I think. And it, um, and I knew I wanted to be in film. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a director or a cameraman. But my grandfather was a photographer and um, I kind of got into photography in my early teens. And I think I kind of, not knowing the, 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 the line between director or cinematographer, I think I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer, but I thought it was the director <coughs> who did the job that the, uh, the actually the cinematographer ended up doing. But anyway, so I went, I knew what I wanted to do, and I had um, quite scientific parents, and they, they wanted me to get a proper degree before I went into the world of film. So they were pushing me to go and do physics at Cambridge. Um, but I started, in my late teens, I started assisting photographers on Saturdays and weekends. Ended up doing a lot of wedding phot photography and doing a lot of um, commercial corporate photography. And then I lived, I grew up quite near the National Film School. I, l I grew up near in Maidenhead, which is the next town along from Beaconsfield, where the National Film School is, or is still. And I started assisting on their shorts and uh, met a lot of people I was doing it and started loading and focus pulling on more and more projects. And uh, while building my career as a camera assistant, I also went and um, uh, to university to um, study cinematography. Well, I did a, an art foundation course and then a degree in cinematography, basically. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the short film we're going to show in a minute, uh, where did that come in all of this? Was that... Um, well, between, between, having, between having started work as a wedding photographer to having... <laughs> to being, going to film school. At about the age of 19, 20, I started shooting shorts. And I think I did about 30 odd shorts. And this is probably, I'd say about the 30 second. Or 30 second, okay. 30 second short. Uh, so, well, let's, let's, let's have a watch. And then, does it need any introduction? I, tend, um, I find these things tend to be often not, but is it that wacky that it'll scare us? No, it's, it's, a, it's a Victorian fairy tale. Okay, great. I was hoping that your first effort was going to be kind of ropey and then, you know, the later stuff <laughs> which would make it look, you know, put it to shame, but that really wasn't. Uh, ropey to you. What, what, how, what, what are the mistakes that you can see? Because no, I can't see a lot. It's really funny seeing your own work, oh, especially um, after such a long time, um, because all you see is your mistakes, really. I think... Can you uh, name... What, what, what were they in that? I think it's really difficult to... I mean, it's basically... I think one of the ways is, as a cinematographer, you're quite, or I am, quite analytical of my own work because I tend to, to some extent, you're, any cinematography is self-taught um, by your own critical or self-criticism, really. Um, I don't know, if I were to shoot that film again, I'd do it very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like it. I do like the uh, look of it and I do like the, um, the overall feel of the piece. But then 
you see the storytelling mistakes in it, I think. It's not just cinematography, I think it's a storyteller, there are little mistakes in it where the film could be a slightly more engaging and slightly more laid out to the audience. It kind of comes across slightly more abstract than actually we designed it to be. So. You designed it to be? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I didn't really get involved until she said, hey, you've got a rat, haven't you? And then, yeah. you know, then there was... Uh, has anybody got any burning questions about that, that first clip on, on the cinematography side or anything else? Did you, um, uh, do you prefer it when you have full control of the camera and the director just deals with everything else? Or do you prefer to work closely with somebody who has their own ideas about well, you know, the framing and the angles and all that? You know, it's, um, I quite enjoy working with both types of directors, but what I do enjoy mostly is having a director that you have a strong collaboration with. Mm. Whether that's a director who's quite anal about uh, composition or the camera work, or it's a director who prefers to work with the actors, I don't mind. I think what I really prefer is having a, a really one-on-one -on -one collaboration with a director and really getting inside what you're trying to do as a collaborative team. Um, sometimes it can be if you're doing a longer project, it can be quite hard to take when a director's really quite full on with, uh, with their compositions because you do... Composition's such a, a personal um, thing. It's very difficult to kind of... To, uh, it's all about your own taste, really, and it's very difficult to kind of start taking it apart or, or being directed to do something in a composition, I mean, you can definitely tap into director's compositional sense, but it's um, you know when they're actually take, when they're actually being Telling. quite direct about your composition, it's quite a personal thing to kind of put up with, really. Do you prefer working with storyboards or not, uh, or don't mind? I, d I don't mind. I think storyboards I find useful at a prep stage when you're actually devising how to tell a story, and when you're actually breaking a script down. When you're on, on set, I think story, storyboards become a bit of a handicap. I think it's a really useful tool to talk to a director and find out what they're actually thinking about or how they're actually seeing the story being told. But when you're on set, I think you really have to tap into what the actors bring on the day with them and, and just to be open visually to to, you know, it's the first time you see the, the scene blocked out, it's the first time you see it on location, it's most, most of the time it's the first time you've actually seen the actors playing out the scene, so I think it's really important to kind of keep your senses open to all those new things, and if you kind of bring a really regimental kind of storyboard to that, then I think it can actually handicap you, and actually it kind of shrouds your senses to, to what you should, you should actually be open to as a storyteller, really. Uh, so after, you said you did a degree at um, Central St. Martins, is that right? Yes, and then well, after that, London College of Printing. Sorry, London College of Printing. And then you went to the NFTS? Yes. Soon after? Or the next I year? Think, or? Uh, I think there was a year or two in between. And then what year did you graduate from there? I think 2000. 2000. Yeah. And six months later, you, you, helm, you shot your first feature? Or is yes. that right? A clip well, I did, of which... While I was at film school, I did a short with, uh, with a director uh -huh. who then managed to find a script, find, raise the finances, and produce his own first film. And then he asked me to shoot that, basically. OK. Well, it's called Fakers, and we've got a clip of it. Um, might as well have a look at it now. Was that an enjoyable experience, your first feature? It was. It was hard work, yes. Well, OK, I'll ask you. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just stick your hand up and I'll get around to you when, as and when. Um, I love a gratuitous car chase. Uh, <laughs> uh, was there any need in the story to go through Borough Market? Or was that just... There was. Um, basically, the plot is around that they sell the same painting to five galleries and sure. they have to do it within, within uh, an hour of, of, of... Well, within the hour to five different galleries and to get around London, basically, we thought, what's the... We basically, we're trying to do a homage to uh, the Italian job. 
So where could we think, well, we tried to think of a place which is just similar to the piazza in Italy and we thought round Borough, round kind of Tower Bridge was the, the ideal way to do it. So uh, that's... Uh, and what, what was the budget for that project? I think it was around just under a million pounds, which was quite tight. Was it, was it daunting as your first well, uh, that's, um, full length? That's, that's why I said it was quite difficult, um, difficult to do because we, it's, it's my first film was the director's first film, so we brought a lot of ambition to the project and we didn't really want to compromise and, um, and it was very difficult to kind of fulfill those ambitions within the money and the, and the time that we were given or given ourselves. Um, and um, yeah, from that moment, so it was putting up with the compromises, knowing when to compromise, and working quickly, is uh, was actually difficult. Really. Uh, but but uh, and since then, you've done mainly TV and other shorts. Well, I've done uh, TV dramas really, mostly in commercials and music videos. Yeah. I might, unless anyone has any burning questions, I might jump on to the the next clip from, from Life on Mars, just so that we keep within our, our time regulations. Is there any setup needed for this? Um, it, are you okay with that, Paddy? If you're not, okay. Uh, well, give us a shout when you are. <laughs> um, uh, so, but how does, how does one go about like, moving up the, the ladder of getting you know, more work on more high profile projects? Well, I did, I, um, I did Fakers, which I, which I did quite soon after having left film school. And then um, I ended up, afterwards I ended up doing, going back to doing a lot of shorts and commercials and music videos. And um, it was only a year after that I did another film and then subsequently did a film straight after that. And then um, I wanted to do, I hadn't done any TV dramas at that stage, so I wanted to do, try my hands at doing some TV dramas. So I, uh, my agent and I made a conscious decision to try and get some TV drama. I didn't work. know there were cinematographers agents, but I guess of course there are. Yes, there were. Yeah, there What's are. your agent like? Is, it a, is he a money-grubbing um, swine? Well, <laughs> no, I think, I think as a cinematographer's agent, I think it's, I think it's important that you have someone who's, who's, uh, who likes your work but knows you personally and can actually guide you. I think it's, it's quite difficult to kind of choose what to do next, and it's quite nice to have someone who's objective to it to some extent, but also as a, a subjective kind of guidance on how, where you want to have your, where you want your career to be moving, and what, what direction you want your career to be moving, and to actually help you guide you along and give you objective opinions along the way. So I think it's kind of a collaboration. I find my, my agent is someone who I actually, again, collaborate with to try and choose or try and find projects that are that, that I would find fun and creatively satisfying to do. And does he take more or less than 10%? Uh, she takes 10%. She takes 10? Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I had another question, but it's completely popped out of my mind. Is that clip ready yet, Paddy? <laughs> Can't get the star. Um, oh, yes, that was it. Uh, now, I've seen a fair bit of your work in, in the... In, partly in the last week or so, okay. knowing that you're coming along. But uh, before we see more of it, can you describe what you think is your particular style? Or you see, that's one thing I don't think I have. I, I really, one of my ambitions early on was not to be labelled as a cameraman with a style. I really try and, and also I find it boring that if you if you are labelled to have a style, that you keep stamping it onto from one project to the other. And I find, um, I find it really challenging to come up with a new style for every project that I do. I mean, there's little sensibilities that you'll probably find you know, in all of my little projects, but I try and, find, I try and be different as, as I can. Do you have heroes of cinematography, the guys you think, I, yeah? They... I have a lot of people I look up to. Um, who's, the, who's the top three, then? I, it's, I, again, kind of, they... they they go from one school to the other. I mean, I, there's people I really appreciate in the American school, people like Conrad Hall and Nestor Almandros. Um, but then also I, I, I have an affinity with European cinema, so I like the uh, work of a lot of Polish cameramen. 
um, Piotr Sobocinski or lots of people. It's really difficult to pick uh, individual um, DPs. Um, I think, you know. That's cool. That's, yeah. We've got the clip ready. Uh, so. In fact, you, you could just leave it running, Le leave it running, and maybe, maybe whilst we're talking, you know, it'll be, it'll be extra in case people get bored of looking at our ugly mugs. <laughs> okay. uh, so that was, um, there was a clip from, was that the second series or the first series? That was the first series. The first series? Yes. Okay, and you've also worked on the second series? I've, uh, yes, since done the second series. And it's yeah. now getting pretty high ratings, I understand. Do you it's know? not doing too badly, no. We're into the second episode this week, and it's, yeah, it's, it's doing well. It's a nice feeling. Does, the, 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 does everyone, I don't know, do people start popping champagne corks from I don't TV know. I mean, do I, well. uh, I don't really pay much attention to it. I really enjoyed making the programme, and I think it's a, really, it's, got, it's a really interesting series to work on, and for me, that's enough, really. I think I had, I've got a really strong um, collaboration with the director who I worked with, and we've since done many projects together, and, and uh, for me, that was enough, really. If the audience like it, then fine. If they don't, they Stuff don't. But, but it's, it's quite. I mean, I think it's quite. A, um, it's 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 not everyone's cup of tea, really, because it's 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 not just your. It's it's a cop show with a bit of substance, and it can be a bit Twin Peaksy, and some people don't really tap into that. So, it's not really a formula for um, audience figures, really. It's not Baywatch. It's not Baywatch. No. Uh, there's a question at the back. Right, I mean, it's quite a challenging show to work on, especially with this director, because she likes to throw the camera about. Right. Which normally means um, she's doing 360s or 180s, which means you're panning around a set. You're for breaking the degree, line. Which is a cameraman's nightmare, because you're having to, to hide lights, and, and it's quite a challenge. Um, but I, I like challenges, so <laughs> it's... Um, most of it, we I try and build in the lighting into the sets, which means I try and light through the windows, or I try and use practicals, or I try and make it as naturalistic as possible. And um, that's kind of one of the tricks that I, I find that helps me to do such elaborate shots, really. Um, also, stylistically in the show, because it's meant to be happening in his head, so he actually doesn't actually go back to 1973. He, uh, we've stylistically we used a di uh, we used a device where we actually left lamps. You actually get glare from flares through the windows and and practicals just to 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 give it a sort uh, a sense of hyper reality really. So I left a lot of, a lot of the lamps actually in the shot. If you look at the the CID, the uh, police station the windows actually flare out. Those are actually the lamps right in the middle of the shot, basically. And, uh, and was there much post to give it a slightly 70s feel, like the mm. slightly orangey, or did you manage to do that in camera? A lot of it is in camera, actually. I mean, we were quite selective when we set up the series to choose a very specific colour palette in them in the, the, art, the art design or the art direction in the costumes and the makeup and, and we've just accentuated a little bit in the photography but because it's such a narrow colour palette I think um, it kind of, a lot of it happens in front of the camera so there's very little post work on it actually I mean the, it's, um, it's graded, of course it's graded but it's, it's, we've just put a bit of contrast into it and just, um, just desaturated it a little bit And what did you use to shoot this? We shot hey. this uh, on 60 mil. Okay. Cool. Uh, unless anyone has any particular questions, let's take a break now and then reconvene at 15 minutes time. So I make that uh, five past eight when we'll watch some more clips and talk some more camera stuff. <laughs> The way Sam responds to these sensory tests will be crucial. I haven't finished yet. Sam. 
have a name on the radio. What, you got a dedication? Sam. You must have heard that! Right. Uh, so that uh, anybody that was some people that were watching BBC what, One was it on Tuesday? BBC One, yeah. Tuesday. Would already be fully aware of uh, the plot going on there. <laughs> um, uh, tell us a little bit about the ex well, that clip we just saw. Well, you were talking to me before just there about about low angles and, and high angles. Well, and again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of style. Um, I think we we kind of invented a, a rule a rule book earlier early on in this series. We tried to follow it as much as possible, and and uh, it went. The rules went along the lines of um, no subtlety in terms of camera angles. We often went from really low angle, extreme low angles, to top shots, and most of the, the even the, the even the close ups were shot um, waist height or even below waist height to give you that low low angle effect. And we had something called a low angle prism um, in the kit, which is um, uh, a way of getting a, an extreme low angle shot using a, a prism. Um, so basically... What is that? Is that an attachment on the end? It basically attaches to the front of the, uh, the lens element, and it's, it's, a, it's a glass prism. And it works uh, a bit like the same way as if you were to look into a 45 degree... Right. Mirror, yeah, yes. basically. So you put the, you put the camera at a slight angle, and you're looking into mirror, which looks as if you put the camera, if you've dug a hole and put the camera looking sure. up, basically. Awesome. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Balaz at this point? Um, that was ungraded. That was actually an ungraded version. So the previous clip that we saw before the break was a finished graded the copy or. And this was an unfinished, ungraded clip. So you can kind of see the comparison between an ungraded and graded. Now, because really there's going to be a progression between the first series and the second series, but because that was ungraded. Well, yes, there was. I mean, in terms of we've, we, when we made the second series, we were very conscious to make sure that the first episode of the fir uh, second series was almost like the ninth episode of the first series. So in terms of the look, we didn't really want to change too much. We wanted to kind of... We wanted the two series to gel early on and then make the shift through the series, as it were. Have you ever had any... Uh, oh, go for it. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the grading. Yes. The poster. How much say and how much involvement do you have over that? Uh, I do... Pretty much I do... I have a colourist who I work with quite regularly. And um, I look, basically I sit in on the grades. We normally get two days per hour's... TV, so each episode is graded over two days, and I spend both days, if I'm available, I spend both days there and pretty much do the grade myself with the colorist. So a lot, basically. Uh, have you ever been on any really nightmare shoots where just everything went wrong or? All the time. <laughs> well, uh, can you give us an example without mentioning any names? I mean, how do, how do, you, how do you deal with um, it? I, I imagine that a show like Life on Mars is, is, is pretty well run, but, um, well, it's or is it not? You, you, have, you have difficulties on a daily basis on every show you go on, um, or every project you go on. Um, in terms of, um, you have a nightmare day, you know, quite regularly, but you know, you can, I mean, something like Life on Mars, once you kind of set up the, the machine of Life on Mars, there's a there's a comfort basis of of having a well rehearsed or well oiled machine um, that just keeps on running and whenever there's any problems you tend to because the crew are quite gelled and you know the director and you know the producers you can well work together to rectify problems but when you don't have that when you go into a for example you go into a music video where you kind of work with the the crew the first time or the director for the first time, you can, it's more difficult to rectify problems there because you're, 
you don't have a history. There's no safety blanket there to work with. Have, have you ever had to? Have you ever left a, a shoot in the middle and said, uh, I, "I can't work like this"? I no, I haven't. I, I don't. That's kind of one of my. I I make a rule not to do that really. I when I agree to do something, I try and see it through. Though I uh, though I have left projects before having to start shooting. Um, in terms of nightmares, you, know, you can come. To, you know, often sometimes. You know, I've had shoots where they've forgotten. You turn up and the day you turn up at seven o'clock, ready to start working, and someone's forgotten to order the camera. So you sit around for three hours waiting for the camera to be delivered, which means you have three hours less to do a day's work. So, you know, you have problems, all sorts of problems. And, and what? Well, how long does your average day run to? Uh, ten hours. Ten hours. Well, ten standard. hours on camera. Yeah, that's ten hours. Basically, ten hours plus one for lunch. Plus one for lunch. Yeah, that's 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 a standard, really. Awesome. Uh, we've got another short here. Uh, do we need Definitely any intro short. to that? Oh, is it? What? I don't. Uh, oh no, it's a film, isn't it? it it's a it's a one-off uh, BBC that's called Stan. Film. It's not. It's a, It's an hour long. It's an hour long. It's but, a, it's a, but no, we we're watching a short clip. Aha, uh -huh, sorry. <clears throat> That's quite a nice cliffhanger, actually. Uh, what, hap what happens? Do the, do, does well, the story is about the last meeting of Lauren Hardy, and he's on his deathbed, and they hadn't spoken for they haven't spoken for years, and uh, this is this is um, Stan saying goodbye to Ollie. Cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions before before I dive in? It's very ah. Uh, Uh, I tend to choose. I tend to choose stock on on quite a pragmatic basis, really. I I prefer low speed stocks. So I uh, my favourite stock is you know the hundred day say or two hundred day say stocks, and um, I tend to work with that as much as I can, purely because I I, I know them well. Um, I know their characteristics. Um, but also, I quite like the contrast. I think the low, low speed stocks have a slightly stronger contrast, and I, I prefer that, especially Life on Mars, which is quite a contrasty show. It actually suits it. So that's why I tend to use those stocks. Um, also, for TV, I, I tend to find that um, because you, we shoot a lot of 60 mil for television dramas. I tend to like to keep the grain structure as tight as possible, i.e. trying to keep it as less grainy as possible, which means that the slower stocks tend to give me that, which hold up better for HD uh, transmission, and you have less problems with it when it actually goes through the uh, compression on digital TV. Okay, so that was kind of part of my question, mm. Well, I, I, my favourite stock is 100 ASA stock. So if I can afford to shoot something on 100 ASA stock, I'll do it on that. Um, unless something's actually, unless I'm looking for a, a low con look, where well, I'll tend to go the other way. Um, but most of the time, a 200 ASA stock will give me enough flexibility to to go into pretty pretty much any situation. It'll help me. Most of the studio stuff was shot on 200 ASA, and um, it just gives me a range of I can I know how dark I can go with it and and um, I know that stock really well basically. Well, it kind of depends from director to director. I think a director cinematographer relationship is 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 like a marriage really. You kind of you I think as a as a cameraman you have to be quite. You have to adapt to the personality and, and the work ethic of a director. 
and you try and mold yourself to what they're looking for in a DP. And some directors give you ultimate freedom in terms of what the camera's doing because they prefer to work with the, with the actors. But some directors are really hands-on with the camera and like to have an input on it. So it really depends um, on the director you're working with. I think as a, as a cameraman, I try and, try and mould myself um, as much as possible to, to suit how each director I work with likes to work. Uh, I'd quite like to go on to the, the last clip because it, it's quite different from that. I mean, uh, uh, yes, I would say the other, the other end of the spectrum in terms of compared to a quiet, gentle mood piece. Right, yes. Uh, is that ready? Uh, you made that in, was it 2004? I can't remember, uh, three, three years ago, yeah. Okay, and... Summer of 2004. Uh, I like the concept of that film, about a DJ that gets mm. tinnitus and goes deaf and then kind of what, what, what was it like filming, was it, I trust that was on location somewhere hot. It was in Ibiza. Were there any particular challenges that you wouldn't experience here? I, th I think just surviving in Ibiza comes with its challenges, you know, for three months. Um, it's uh, because it's a small island logistically it was quite a difficult place to shoot a film in even to the extent of the roads are so narrow you can't take your normal trucks with you so we had to downsize trucks which meant that we had to downsize on equipment if we needed anything special we had to ship it in from Madrid so that took three or four days um, and so, all sorts of uh, logistical headaches, really. And melting cameras, you mentioned. Oh yes, I mean we we shot this ca we shot this the film on HD, and we were shooting in the the height of the summer. So normally it was about 45 degrees in the middle of the day, and we shot for I think about 40 odd days. And over the 40, well, we got a brand new camera. By the end of it. The body, the plastic body panels on the camera had to be changed because they're all melted. The camera was still working, but... Uh, does anybody have any questions? No. I always worry when they're... Uh, or have you ever seen credit for your work being given to a director or an... No, I, I have to say I haven't come across that. I think... I think... I think when you make a film, I think it's very much a team effort. It's, and um, I, th I think I think the cinematographers are being recognised more and more. I think people are becoming more and more educated in terms of how films are made and and what it takes to actually produce and make a film. And I think just by way of that, people are giving cinematographers more recognition. So I think. Um, I think no, I think, I think we've given enough credit. Uh, do you, it's a, it's a bit of a, almost a cliche, but I always like it anyway. What, what advice would you give to um, people who want to, you know, as, as, uh, improve their skills in cinematography or, or work their way up or, or anything? Um, I don't know, I think, I think the most important thing is to to love what you're doing and to actually have the right level of self-criticism of your own work and be analytical of your own work because I think what cinematography is is you're just refining your you're refining your aesthetic taste in certain things and trying to kind of tune your skills of, of manipulating stocks and camera and lighting to suit your aesthetic uh, sensibilities. And I think you're just constantly refining that and just it's nice to be able to analyze your work and to kind of draw, draw lessons from it. I actually, I constantly look at my own work and, and see my mistakes and 
that's partly the process, that you actually do recognise your mistakes and you actually take those away from every project. Really. What was the last mistake you recognised, an example? Oh, lots of mistakes. No, no, just a little thing then. What did I you, can't remember. Just I like can't. overlit, underlit, what, camera wrong place? What's Always, you know, in terms of either the camera's in the wrong place or slightly overlit or slightly too dark. Or my, my new thing at the moment is, is uh, being able to see the actor's eyes enough and, and um, just little things. I go through little phases. There's a question over. Two questions, actually. Have you ever had a faulty finger where you've recorded, the, the recorded after you, you press cut, you think you've, record, you've actually recorded um, as a mistake? And do you understand what I mean? You press the yes, yes, yeah. I do. And also, secondly, are you at a stage in your career where you now can, the producers give you freedom to have as many gadgets and toys and lights and, as you want to, so you have trucks full of lights, or do you still have to be creative and work your way around things and make make do with oh, I don't think I don't think I've reached the stage where you're given every toy that you can afford. I think constantly um, you find yourself in a situation where you're not having enough gadgets or equipment to work with. Um, I actually like to go from the extremities of doing something like Life on Mars where you have a quite a big crew and, and two cameras and a two trucks full of lights to going back and doing a music video with just a, a, an HDV camera. Um, I just find that it's quite nice to go from one extreme to the other because it does remind you of um, what it's all about and what little tools you can actually get away with doing the, the same job and just try, just force, I like forcing myself to be a bit more inventive and putting myself in situations where you actually do have to think about uh, the ways of solving the same problems, but on a smaller scale, really. And also, it's quite nice to... There's so many different... As a cinematographer, there's so many different tools to work with. You know, you've got 35mm, 60mm, you've got all sorts of different degrees of HD and video, and, and it's quite nice to... Rather than just... You know, there's so much equipment coming out nowadays. Like, you get introduced to these little HDV cameras, for example, and it's nice to look at it and play with it, but you don't really get to know that tool until you actually take it out and shoot something with it. And um, you don't often get the choice of shooting all those with all those tools. So it's quite nice to do something at the other extremity where you're actually using a, you know, a, a domestic camera and just trying to kind of go back to basics, basically. Mm. Uh have I ever not shot? I do that all the time, actually. I'm so used to working with film that I, I actually... I know that the camera's turning over because I can hear the sound of the film going through. Um, and with video, especially HD, I don't have that. So there's often... And I, I tend to operate, my, uh, operate a lot. But for some reason, I'm not used to seeing that little red light in the viewfinder. And I, I'm so busy looking at the frame that sometimes that little red light's not on when it should be. And I have done that a lot, actually. I've done that quite recently and got into quite a lot of trouble with it. But, but um, uh, oh, no, at the front, and then we'll go to the back. Me. Yes, you. Uh, do you feel you still get more control when shooting on films, since you're not necessarily displaying your exposure choices and everything as much? <laughs> No, do you know what? I think there's a lot of... I think HD's mystified a lot. Um, I, I, I was trained on film, and I, my attitude to working as a DP or methodology is, is kind of uh, very much film-orientated. So when I work with HD, I, um, I try to adapt that to it. And um, I tend to rely on the monitor as little as possible, really. Um, I find that you know HD in comparison to film has got um, people try and emulate film shooting HD, but HD's got a, a really interesting look of its own, and I think the best results you will get out of HD is if you embrace that and try and rather than emulating to make it look like film, you embrace HD for what it is and try and use the characteristics of HD to work for whatever story you're trying to tell. Um, so, in response to that, I think, you know, 
I think, I, I just, I think it's really, you just have to, you know, you're doing the same job as a cameraman. You're lighting for drama or dramatic effect. And um, on, when you're working on film, you train your eye to, to be able to judge the characteristics of a film stock. And you can do that very much with HD if you set it up properly and if you trust the camera you're using. And I try and do that as much as I can, really, and not rely on the monitors as much. Um, I'm both actually. I'm I'm a big fan of the zone system. I don't know if that says much, but I what I tend to do is I when I start lighting something, I normally tend to light. I, when I go into a scene, I pretty much know what stop I'll light for. So I'll decide early on I'm going to light this scene to to a certain stop. I actually tend to stay to the same stop throughout a project sometimes. Um, so I'll set one light using my incident meter, and I'll set that. And then from then, once that light is set, I'll put everything in by eye. And then from then on, the spot meter comes out to see how dark the dark places are. Mm. Uh, we'll go to Julian at the back, and then we'll have a question. What is it that attracts you to a project? Is it the director, the script, the visual challenges, the money, or the schedule? What is it that, what, how do you choose? Uh, it's definitely not the schedule, but um, I think it's it's predominantly it's the script and the director really. And I've done projects that I really didn't like the script, but once I met the director and the producer, I I really like them as creative people. And I did the project because I really thought I could enjoy working with them and make something interesting out of a project that didn't look interesting from the from first appearances. I, um, I've also made a personal rule to myself not to really say no to projects from a script point of view until I've actually met the people that are involved. So I will always read the script and always say uh, I'd like to meet the people and then once I've met the people involved that's when I'll make a decision whether I want to do it or not. Money really doesn't, it doesn't really come into it, to be honest. Um, visual challenges, visual challenges <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think that comes with the script. I think when you read a script, you can judge how visually challenging it is. So I think you can, you know, I think visual challenges versus, you know, stroke script are the same kind of uh, judgment call, basically. Cool. Uh, there was a question in the middle, and we'll go to the back and then the side. I just want to say, you said you studied physics before. Yeah, well, yes. Do you think that's given you a foundation to your aesthetic that sets you apart from other Right. No, I mean, uh, yeah. I went on to, my parents really wanted me to get a proper degree. So I looked at all these cameramen's credits rolling off the screen, and they all had BSc after their name. So I thought, you know, they must all have bachelor of science degrees. So I, that's what I went along with uh, to, to, to try and get physics. But I actually, um, I had a, a little fallout with my parents because they all had me packed off to go to study physics in Cambridge. And I came, before having started the degree, I literally said, no, I don't really want to do it. I want to go to film school. And then I, uh, I backed out of going to study physics and went to do... I did, I did it all the way up to A-level, and then uh, I turned, well, I didn't go to university studying physics. But I think, I think as a cinematographer, there is a certain level of um, sign, you know, some, actually some cinematographers are technically minded, some aren't. But I find that um, having, you know, studied physics to, to high school level, it's given me... Uh, um, it's actually affected the way I actually tackle problems because as a cinematographer, it's all about problem solving on the day, whether you're trying to light a certain shot or you're, it, it, it's problem solving, whether it's mathematical problems or physical problems, but it's, it's problem solving. And, and actually having um, done maths and physics is giving me a certain logical, logical uh, frame of mind to be able to do those problems. Uh, question at the back. I just wonder if when you've received scripts, uh, how often, if at all, you get a uh, camera treatment of it, if that's helpful or if that's something that you can do? 
think different writers write scripts different ways. Some some writers are really visually minded and actually put a lot of stage direction and camera direction into their scripts. Um, and some aren't. Um, I I think they don't really affect me, to be honest, because when I read a script, automatically I start pre-visualizing images as I'm reading it. And those are the images that I get excited by, or those are the things that I actually either find intriguing, or, or if I don't have those images, then I probably won't find that script that interesting. So I think I find those more useful than having uh, a synopsis or a camera treatment from a director. But I do find that if you're, if, if it's a director I've never worked with before, having seen a page layout of what they're intending to do visually gives me a really good idea in terms of what they're like as a director, in terms of whether they're quite visually minded or whether I find their visual ideas intriguing or interesting. Or So it's kind of, it tells me more about the actual person directing the film than actually the project itself. There's a question over by the mm. wall there. Uh, do you have um, I have, yes, I have. How did I find it? Yeah. I find documentary probably the most difficult uh, aspect of filmmaking, or different, diff the most difficult genre of filmmaking, to be honest, especially from a cameraman's point of view, because you're constantly, you're, for example, you're filming something, and the subject or the story that you're filming constantly evolves because it's unfolding itself right in front of your eyes. And because you can't really be specifically directed as a cameraman when you're filming documentaries, you have to make decisions as a cameraman. And some of those decisions are directorial decisions. And some of those decisions actually influence whether you're telling the story right or wrong, or whether you're actually telling the right story. Because, for example, if, if the story's changing right in front of your eyes and you're suddenly not picking up on those changes and you keep following what you've thought the story's going to unfold, it, then you could actually miss out on the, on the most interesting part of that. And I think it's, um, as a cameraman, you're constantly having to ask yourself, is this what it's about? Is this what it's about? Is this, is this really the most interesting aspect of what we're filming. And um, sometimes you have to literally, you know, reverse tack and, and, and change, um, change your, you know, the, the actual point of view of the story that you thought you were going to film. I think so, and I think uh, I think you have to kind of learn a much clearer shorthand with the directors in documentaries because I, I think directors really come into making documentaries when they're editing, and I think that's why a lot of documentary directors shoot themselves now because they because because there's so many directorial decisions being made by the cameraman there. And I think it's easier for them to be in control of it. Whereas a lot of documentaries in the past were shot on film, which didn't really allow directors to, to shoot it themselves. Um, they had to rely on a cameraman. But now with, with the advent of, of smaller cameras and video, people, directors shoot their own films. And, and, and they can actually be more control of the film when you're actually shooting as opposed to when you're editing. Right, one last question and then I'll really go for it. Um, do you find it as a kind of film based DOP, do you find it difficult to shoot documentaries on video and actually let the camera roll? It's been a while since I've actually done documentary, but yes, I did. It was, it, it took me a while to kind of, to really settle into it. And I still find it quite a challenge. And I think we have to be really quick and sharp minded and really be analytical of of what you're what you're filming really and you as a as a drama camera you do get comfortable with your with with having a crew around you and 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 also having a script that you can actually break down and think about whereas in a documentary scenario you don't have that so you have to be a slightly quicker off your quicker off the mark as well Right, someone's sneaking in a question on the corner of the next show. Go again. Just, just out of interest, I wonder if you know, or if you have any 
beliefs of why there's not that many women um, camera people. Why there's not that many good camera people? Women camera people. Yeah. Um, I think they're, they're beginning to be more and more, to be honest. Uh, I think the industry <coughs> had a really strong male orientation in, in the past, and I think that uh, just the mentality of crews didn't really help women getting into that. And even if they did, it, it, it was quite difficult for them to kind of settle into that. But um, I think a lot of women are kind of coming through and, 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 and fighting against that and, and are actually producing really strong work. And, and I think there are going to be a lot more female cinematographers, and there are. And I think, I think when you look at the intake of the National Film School at the moment, I think it's pretty much 50-50 now. Cool. Oh, go on. Sorry. Try. I think as a cameraman, every shot's your shot, really. You try and. Um, but I mean, did I mean, you have any tips for that? Was there one particular shot that was a bit different? Did you have a genius idea and the director said, no, no, I want to do that way? And you said, no, do it my way. In I'll prove it to you. And then you proved it to no, him I, and he said, uh, you're a god. I've okay. had that situation. I've had that situation where I was actually put on the spot and come up with a great idea visually for a, square, uh, for, a, for a scene or opening of a scene and the director wasn't quite comfortable with it and on the day he said, okay, but we'll try it. Or before the day would say, okay, we'll try it. And on the day I would actually go, okay, so you're directing it now and I'd had to kind of, you know, she put me on the spot, but... Um, but it worked out? It worked out, yeah, so I made my point that time, I think, just about. But... Um, I can't think of one at the moment well, from the clip. Um, there was the um, gentleman in the last film, um, Lauren. Yes, the yeah. stand, yeah. He was sitting in his chair, had his hat on, and there was a zoom, kind of close up of his face, was zooming in, yeah. and then it stopped, and then it jumped even yeah. closer, yeah. and then it zoomed in again, and yeah. the third time. Yeah. Just, that was really interesting. And that wasn't my idea. That was no. kind of, no, that was the director's idea. I think what we did there is, I, I think, we did a continuous tracking shot, and that got cut into three. Yeah, it got edited into three segments. Yeah, I think no. sometimes I mean, yes. You, you really I think so because sometimes you, you when you when you're shooting a scene, you kind of pre-visualise the way it's going to be cut, and uh, sometimes you come up with a scene or you see a scene that actually gets cut in a completely different way to how you envisioned. But um, sometimes I find it more interesting and I find it a really good idea. Sometimes I find, you know, the original idea was probably stronger. Yeah. But it probably didn't work, you know. For, for some reason, it might, the drama might, might not have worked with the original idea, so I had to kind of be, reinvent the way that scene was going to be cut, really. I think it's, again, with any, any aspect of filmmaking, you, it's problem-solving. And sometimes if, if a certain idea doesn't work, then you have to find other ways of of making it work, and that's very much editing for you. Right, what, just to wrap it up, what are your ambitions for the future, or plans? Is there any, any nut you have yet to crack? Uh, I want to go and do more films, really. I think, um, and I just, well, I, I really enjoy building on the collaborations I've found so far with directors, and just, just trying to build on those relationships, really. I kind of, I think the stage I'm at at the moment is that I've got um, several relationships that I really value and really enjoy creatively, and um, I'm just trying to nurture those for for the future. You know, and some of those relationships started off in television dramas, and I'm hoping to take those to you know to the bigger screen. Cool. Right. We're going to leave it there. Um, but before I th we say thank you to Balaj properly, I have to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, Cine Information is looking for people to get involved. Uh, we need a production assistant or somebody that can help with some uh, production assistant type work and also a, a website bod to help with our, with our website needs, which aren't great. Manek do you want to say something? Um, just what can you do? What's that? 
Oh. Screen, it There's a free seminar on the 28th of February at the Watershed um, for anybody that's thinking of going to Cannes. Southwest Screen are putting together a do. Um, their email list is quite good. If you're not on that already, it's worth, worth, uh, worth going to the website and signing up for. Otherwise, thank you very much to uh, Dan and Sam from Kodak for helping put on this event and getting Balaj to be with us. Uh, the Watershed, um, Sarah on the door and uh, 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 Paddy on the uh, audiovisual stuff for, um, if, if it weren't for the Watershed, uh, we couldn't do this. Dave and all his crew from UE for, for filming it, and I think that's just about everybody. Balaj uh, came to this country aged eight uh, from Hungary, and uh, a day after arriving in the country, speaking no English, went to school for the first time, an English school, and has ever since has been chronically shy of talking. So we're very <laughs> glad that he was uh, up for coming and sharing his uh, wisdom and knowledge with us. So thank you very much, Balaj. And thank you, thank you to James for doing the interpreting as well. Uh, have a safe journey home, everybody.